NASA just awarded Blue Origin a contract to fly a small little overlooked camera to the surface of the moon that could have a big impact on how we land on the moon and where we land on the moon. The results of this camera, this mission, will inform how Blue Origin, how SpaceX, and how NASA move forward with lunar landings in the future. We are entering a whole new territory here that was not covered by Apollo. We need new data to inform a new era of lunar exploration. I am the executive director of space consulting firm Astrolytical, and I also did some of this type of research for my doctoral studies. So I'm going to geek out a little bit on the science here as well as we talk about the plume of facts on lunar regolith. Regolith here is the dirt and dust and little rocks on the surface of the moon. And the plume we're talking about are the engines, the retro rockets that will be slowing down these landers as they touch down on the surface of the moon. This little camera that NASA just awarded to a blue origin mission is the Stereo Cameras for Lunar Plume Surface Studies. That was a procurement. So NASA determined that Blue Origin was the only one who was capable of meeting the requirements to deliver this to the surface of the moon. And I'll talk about that. This is actually the third of these cameras. And this one is gathering data that the first two can't or didn't gather. The Blue Origin mission in question is the Pathfinder mission for its Mark I Blue Moon lunar lander. This is not a crewed lander. It will not have people on board yet. That's the Mark II. Blue Origin has decided to self-fund a mission to the surface of the moon with its smaller Mark I Blue Moon. Backing up for a little bit, NASA awarded two contracts to two providers to deliver humans to the surface of the moon. The first award went to SpaceX for its Starship human landing system. That will deliver astronauts to the surface of the moon and back up again on Artemis 3 and 4. Blue Origin was awarded the contract for Blue Moon for Artemis 4 and 5. But before those two companies fly people to the surface of the moon, they are going to land their own versions of their landers uncrewed on the surface of the moon, you know, to demonstrate that they can. Blue Origin has said that they are ramping up to fly Mark 1 to the surface of the moon next year. In fact, there was a recent Federal Communications Commission, FCC, filing that said that Blue Origin was preparing to land the Pathfinder mission on the surface of the moon at no earlier than March 2025. This would be on top of New Glenn, which is Blue Origin's new rocket that has not yet launched yet. They are hoping to launch New Glenn this year. I do believe that they will probably launch New Glenn this year, but launching it on its first test mission, uh, it hasn't gotten to orbit yet, let alone to the moon. So uh, they have to make sure, Blue Origin has to make sure that New Glenn is safe to fly this expensive Mark I blue moon on top of New Glenn before it even attempts this mission. And Blue Origin is not exactly known for being fast. In fact, they are well known for being very slow. So I do believe that it will not launch in March of 2025, but it is reasonable that it could launch in 2025. And in fact, that is what the NASA award says. It says that this camera scalps needs to launch by December 31st of 2025 in order to get the data that NASA needs for Artemis 3 and beyond. Because what it wants to do is to fly this camera, and I'll describe it in a moment. It wants to fly it on this first lander, this uncrewed lander, this blue moon lander, to gather data in order to inform its even larger human landing system landings in the future, Artemis 3 and beyond. Because Blue Origin had already announced that they are self-funding this mission, this Pathfinder Mark 1 mission to the surface of the moon in 2025, and because NASA needs this data in 2025, they decided that they weren't going to open this up for a bid. They were simply going to give the award to Blue Origin because they decided that Blue Origin was the only one who could meet the requirement. And there's one more requirement here, which is it has to, the lander has to have a thrust of at least 8,000 pounds force. We do know that the Mark I has one BE-7 engine. The Mark II, which is the human version, as well as a larger cargo version, that will have three BE-7s. But the Mark I only has one BE-7 engine, and that has a thrust of 10,000 pounds for pounds for us. I did say that there were two other cameras that have already been built and awarded. Those were for smaller missions, the Commercial Lunar Payload Services missions clips. And the first one actually flew on Intuitive Machines Mission 1, IM-1, which as you remember from earlier this year, did land on the surface of the moon, but then tipped over. 
And while it was on its side, it did not have the comms ability, the bandwidth to get data from this particular instrument back to Earth. So unfortunately, even though Scalps flew on IM-1, it could not get the data that it needed. There is another mission that is going to fly Scalps. That is the Firefly Blue Ghost mission, which is scheduled for late this year. And again, that's a smaller lander. And so these smaller landers are not going to get the thrust needed. I'm going to go into the science of why we need the data from the higher thrust, why we want to understand what's going on as these landers, these heavier landers are landing on the surface of the moon. Before I do that, I want to describe Scalp. Scalps is actually four cameras that are mounted to the lander to provide that stereo point of view. We want three dimensions. It starts imaging around 30 seconds prior to landing, and it is capturing the stereo imaging about 84% of the surface of the moon as is as the lander is landing. And then it is also capturing the entire landing process all of the interactions of the engine, the retro rockets, the plume with the surface of the moon, with the regolith. So it will surface about 13 square meters of the surface of the moon as this whole landing happens. There has never been this kind of imaging as a lander has landed on the surface of the moon. So Apollo had cameras, but it was not able, it was not designed to capture this kind of interaction. There have been studies that have looked at Apollo imagery and tried to piece together that interaction, what happens with the whole landing process. And there's only so much we can get from one, that technology, the cameras weren't the greatest back then. And two, the fact that those cameras were not designed to capture this interaction. I'm not going to give it a whole science lesson here, but there are two reasons why we care about what's going on here and why it would affect future missions, especially these larger missions landing humans on the surface of the moon or lots of cargo to the surface of the moon. First, is it safe to land a large lander? The human landing system landers, they're heavier than the Apollo LEMS. They're heavier than anything we've landed on the surface of the moon before. The concern is that the erosion process, the way that the gas from those engines goes through the surface of the regolith and interacts and erodes away, as well as creates un perhaps unstable little crater or large crater under the lander could endanger the lander as it is landing. This is before we build any kind of landing pads, before we build any kind of surface, which can be more stable. And there are proposals, there are studies looking at how do we create an instantaneous landing pad. And that's some interesting work right there, but we're not there yet. That's not the human landing system plan at this time. For Artemis 3, 4, 5, 6, that's not the current plan. We have to know that these landers are going to be landing just on naked regolith, this, this body of sand and dirt and dust that we don't fully understand. And we need to make sure those landers are going to be safe, especially if they are carrying humans on board, that it's not going to sink too much, that we can understand that this is going to be a safe place for these astronauts to land. The second reason, and perhaps even more importantly, is that we want to understand what this does to the surrounding area. We know from Apollo that sand blasting happened during the Apollo LEM landing. So I've actually held a piece of the surveyor camera fabric in my hands and looked at the little pits caused by sand blasting from the lunar regolith during this landing process. If you have other facilities, buildings, anything that is nearby the landing site that you don't want damaged, that you don't want sandblasted during a landing like this, you need to know what that safe distance is. You under need to understand what we call the ejecta blanket. How much of the regolith is being kicked up and where is it going? How fast is it going? Is it going to cause damage to anything in a certain radius? We want to understand this not only for you know, the facilities, the, the uh, friendly facilities, the facilities that NASA puts up, but we also want to understand in terms of any other geopolitical body that might be operating on the surface of the moon. And I'm particularly talking about China because China is also planning similar kind of base, a similar kind of facility where they are going to be conducting different types of science and extraction activities on the surface of the moon. We need to understand how far away these landings need to take place so that it does not disturb NASA's own stuff, international partners own stuff, and adversarial nations own stuff. Because the last thing we want to do is be accused of any kind of hostile intent that would be against the Outer Space Treaty. We want to make sure that we are operating safely with due diligence towards all operators on the surface of the moon. And not only that, there is concern that we might kick up regolith that actually goes into lunar orbit. And you can imagine then the danger of having lunar regolith that is in lunar orbit that could perhaps interfere with Gateway or any other launch and landing activity. Lunar gravity is only about one sixth of Earth's gravity. And this is the main reason why we can't really test this on Earth. We can shoot those rockets into the surface of Earth but that's not going to give us the information we need because lunar gravity is so much less than Earth gravity. 
And there are various ways to test microgravity, reduced gravity conditions. In my graduate studies, we went and did some parabolic flights where we had about 25 seconds per parabola. This was with both NASA and with JRG Corporation, where we looked to see what happens if you're in microgravity and if you're in lunar gravity, because those planes can also do lunar marsh in any kind of reduced gravity environment. And so a lot of these studies have been done on these planes that are able to do these dives that can give you approximately 20, 25 seconds of lunar gravity to tell you in those 20, 25 seconds what happens in lunar gravity if you're impacting something into some kind of regular simulant. But that that 20 seconds, 25 seconds, that's not gonna give you a ton of data. And it's also not gonna be high fidelity. Some of you who know a little bit about this topic might have been thinking of Dr. Phil Metzger, who is out of the University of Central Florida. When he was still at Kennedy Space Center, I did spend a summer with him looking at jet plumes and their interaction with regolith, the different types of regolith. We looked at not just lunar and Martian regolith simulants, we actually looked at like um, little pieces of plastic, little corn husk pieces like all kinds of different types of granular bodies because believe it or not solids can act like fluids if they are granular bodies if they're little you know particles of sand or something like that they can act like a liquid but nothing beats the whole process of seeing it land on the moon the real engine interact with real lunar soil real lunar regolith on the surface of the moon in real lunar gravity and that's another thing is that all these simulants we used are not real lunar regolith. NASA does have real lunar regolith, but a teeny, teeny, teeny small amount is used for science. It's not enough to fill the you know sandboxes or even little boxes that we use in the testing. So we need to use regular simulants that are usually different types of quarried material from volcanoes, you know, basalts or something equivalent that is not perfectly replicating the lunar regolith. And also lunar regolith regolith is not monolithic. It's not the same everywhere. You can see with your own naked eye when you look at the moon that the regolith, the, the surface, is different colors, it's different textures, it's different types, it's different ages. There's all kinds of different characteristics depending on where you're landing. That is to say that we want to, instead of simulate this, we want to actually do it. And actually doing it will give us the data we need for modeling so that we can simulate it a little bit better in computer models so that they can ensure that future landings are safe. Now this award, it's a tiny little thing. It's like $6.1 million that NASA awarded to Blue Origin. This is going to be under the radar for so many people, but it could really have long lasting effects if we determine certain things need to change about the Artemis Base Camp or the way that we're doing landings for Artemis 3 and beyond. It could even inform how Starship operates and lands on the surface of the moon or on Mars in the future. Because remember, Mars is also a place where there's a lot of regolith and a reduced gravity body. So this little camera, this little, actually four cameras, is actually super important to how we operate in the future. Which is why lunar data, gathering the basic data that we need to the lunar science is so vital to how we do engineering operations and all aspects of mission planning. If you happen to be a decision maker out there, don't neglect the science, it's important.